Oh, all right. Um, did, did you want us uh, at the beginning of the tape when we start recording? Okay. Hello, my name is Justin Tyler. Today's date is November 2nd, 2009. I am interviewing Larry Quick at Ball State University about his experience in the military during the Vietnam War era. All right, a few general notes here in a second. I'm going to have you say and spell your name for the camera for editing and okay. transcription purposes. Mm -hmm. um, so there goes the um. Sorry, I'm really nervous. If you could... Uh, Just relax, okay. After I ask you a question, if you could give it a few seconds uh, for spacing issues sure. uh, for the editing purpose, and oh, there was something else I kind of left out. If you could kind of try to reiterate the question into your answer, so we okay. uh, it's not just you saying like yes to something. You uh, all right? Right. All right. Could you please say and spell your name? Uh, my name is Larry L A R R Y Quick Q U I C K. All right. Um, can I have a pen? I will drop. Thank you. I forgot to grab mine out of my bag. All right. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Lebanon, Indiana, in January 20th of 1943. What was it like growing up there? Uh, it was kind of nice. It was um, a lazy little community called Big Springs, and um, uh, pretty sparse population. Uh, it was a, my family had been there for a long time, uh, probably going back on both sides. On my mother's side, uh, the Higbees and the uh, uh, Andersons had lived, had had the uh, farm there for, I don't know, a couple of generations before that. So it was, um, it was pretty pleasant. Uh, 20 miles north of Indianapolis, so uh, when we wanted to do something exciting, we could always go to Indianapolis. Um, what were your views on war prior to enlistment? I'm sorry? What were your views on war prior to enlistment? Oh, um, my, my family, I, I kind of idolized my uncle, who was a uh, uh, F-86 pilot in uh, Korea, 315th MiG fighting squadron, they called him, I guess. Um, he used to, every once in a while, would get across a country and they'd be able to fly over our property. And uh, I, I can remember one time he was flying a, a T-6, I think it was, and he, a T-6 has a cockpit that you can roll the top back on and he had it back and he made a turn and he waved and he almost broke his arm. He told us later. How? So, uh, uh, let me let me finish my about my view about the uh, about war. I think um, we we my attitude probably was that uh, you know wars are not a great thing, but sometimes they're a necessity uh, to protect you know to maintain the country, um, the safety of the people. Uh, the status, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. um, how and when did you enter military service? Uh, again, my my uncle probably had a lot to do with that. I always thought that I'd like to be in the Air Force, and uh, so when I entered uh, Butler University, I joined the ROTC detachment there. Um, and, you know, just natural progression, ended up in the Air Force, commissioned. Um, I wanted to go to pilot school, but my last physical before I went into the Air Force, my vision in my left eye was 2040, so I had to, you know, the second choice was navigator's training. So I went to nav school. Uh, what was the transition like actually going from being in an ROTC program at Butler to actually being in the military? Well, in some ways it was really great because my wife and I had, uh, we were married when we were at Butler and uh, I was going to school and working at United Parcel Service overnight. So as far as um, the change in life was really good. It was a regular job. I only had one thing to do um, and the you know, the initial part of it, the schooling was really great. Um, so it was, a, it was a nice change. Uh, what units did you serve in? Um, the, 
the first assignment was the was NAV school and electronic electronic warfare officer school. That was the 3535th NAV training wing, and the 3537th electronic warfare training school. Uh, my assignments after that, I only had one assignment, and that was to the 100th Re Strategic Reconnaissance Wing that was stationed at Tucson, Arizona, and that the uh, 350th Strategic Reconnaissance Squadron. Uh, there were two squadrons in the 100th Wing. One was a U-2 squadron, and ours was the uh, 350th uh, dr Drone Reconnaissance Squadron. Um, other than your uncle that you said you idolized, what were some of the other reasons that you volunteered for service? Um, I, I think at the time I, I really believed that the war in Vietnam was a worthwhile uh, endeavor. Um, I think, you know, during and after that period, um, I, <laughs> you know, when you're in the military, you don't make the, the big decisions, okay? Um, you have a job to do. Uh, you're trained to do the job. You're given plenty of motivation. Um, I think that um, when you're in the position like I was in, um, we pretty much believed in what we were doing. Uh, our specific job was to do reconnaissance, um, and we did re our our specialty was reconnaissance in areas where uh, manned aircraft had a high uh, uh, f not fatality rate. In other words, the planes got shot down, the pilots were lost. So when we flew the mission, um, we felt like. First of all, it wasn't as dangerous for the people involved, and um, we did our, the quality of the reconnaissance was also uh, very good. So we felt like our specific job was a very worthwhile thing. Um, going back to uh, the information sheet that you filled out and sent us, mm -hmm. you had mentioned the 100th Strategic Recon Wing and the right. 350th uh, Strategic Recon Squadron. Could you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, um, we were, there were 12 crews at the time. Um, we had a pretty heavy rotation. We were, um, each crew had eight crew members. Uh, our assignment from about 19, when I got there in 1960, late 67, I think it was, until I left in 1973, um, we were supporting uh, two, reconnaissance locations. One was mostly photo, photo reconnaissance plus testing, and uh, that was mostly in Vietnam, Thailand, the Southeast Asia area. Um, the other one was a um, SIGINT, signal intelligence, uh, communication, uh, radar, that kind of thing, uh, stationed at Osan Air Force Base in, in Korea. So read me the question one more time so I make sure I covered it. Um, I just asked uh, if you could tell me the a units. little bit about the 100th uh, strategic the units. Okay, we, when we were overseas um, to, to kind of minimize the connection with the, our location in the United States, they, call, they designated them as operating locations. They called them Operating Location 20, Operation loca Location OLUA, OL, AG or what, you know, there were a couple of different designations and they changed. Um, they changed our code name several times. We went from uh, Bumblebee to Buffalo Hunter to Bumpy Action. Um, and I'm not quite sure who was, who was that was supposed to fool, but uh, uh, just, uh, I just, just to get, keep us on our toes, I guess. Experience what, uh, experience, sorry, experiencing what you did, uh, would you have still volunteered? Oh, Looking sure, back? I think so. Um, the job I had in the Air Force, <clears throat> if I had to pick um, the, the jobs as a navigator and electronic warfare officer, I cannot imagine a better job than the one I had specifically. Um, 
We were on the cutting edge. We were the, some of the first Air Force units to have computers, uh, and they were really, um, you know, it was early in the stage, early in the process. We had uh, computers that had uh, mylar tapes rather than uh, um, disks, um, and they weren't really reliable, but we had uh, um, remotely controlled airplanes that, that flew around. We went started with uh, no direct video feed, um, used just enormously expensive cameras, high altitude and low altitude, uh, and then eventually we ended up with um, direct TV links so that we could see where we were going, um, you know, pretty much what the drone was doing, what it was experiencing. It's an exciting, it was an exciting job and we were protected pretty well with some, with a few, <laughs> a few gaps here and there. Uh, what was the difference between the low altitude and high altitude drones that you used? Uh, there were, we had a continuum. We had, uh, our, mostly the drones we had were modifications of the Ryan Firebee drone that was used as a target uh, for manned aircraft. And uh, it, it started out very simply. It didn't, at first it didn't have a uh, program internally so that it could fly on its own. The It was controlled by radio control and um, eventually it ended up with a very secure radio control, microwave con control with uh, um, secure data so that we could control it and nobody else could. Um, the uh, low altitude drones had fairly short wings, about 20 feet across, uh, 26 feet long, which is a fairly small airplane, okay? Um, it had a Continental engine, and in the, in the initial models, in the later models, it had a, pre, a quite a bit bigger GE engine. Um, the low altitude models ran somewhere around 550 knots, true airspeed. Uh, the high altitude models, they flew, and also the, the low altitude models flew about, uh, our mission altitudes were usually around 500 feet, which is pretty good as far as survivability goes. Uh, the Vietnamese developed um, some practices that made it a little bit more difficult, uh, but that was even more for the manned aircraft than it was for us. Uh, our, our drones were really pretty more, much more survivable because they didn't have the, um, all of the things that were there to protect the person. Uh, they didn't carry oxygen, you know, they didn't need a lot of the other things that the other drone, the other aircraft, the manned aircraft had. So the low altitude aircraft, we, we experimented with some supersonic drones and they really didn't work out. Um, first of all, it was hard to get them going fast enough so that their stubby wings could support the aircraft. Uh, and the joke was for a while, the first probably five or six missions we flew, we dropped them off of our C-130 and they went right into the water. They just didn't get up enough speed. Um, so we, we pretty much stayed with the the 147 model, which was the, the low altitude, reasonably short wings, um, and it wasn't supersonic by any means. Um, the high altitude models um, were, you know, true airspeed drops as you go up in altitude, okay? So our, the speed of the drone was a little bit faster. Um, the altitude of the drones was well above, I, I, don't, I don't think I could be real specific even now, but I think um, it was well above 65,000 feet. And that's the, the operating location of, the, of most of the MiGs at the time were well below that. So they had to perform a, 
an acrobatic maneuver to get up if they were going to take a shot at it. Uh, and they did that occasionally, but they had to do a lot of work. Um, they probably, at that point, were spending more time trying to, more money and time trying to knock us down than we were spending to send the drones. The difficulty with the high altitude drones was any kind of uh, moisture in the air, and in Southeast Asia there's usually quite a bit of moisture in the air, uh, really limited the, uh, the quality of the photography. Um, we experimented with, now, now those airplanes were very much like the U-2. They were, had extremely long wings. Uh, the wings were probably at least double what the low altitude drones were. Um, and uh, we eventually got away from the, got in, as we developed the airplane, the drones, um, we got more elaborate programs in the drone with computers. We got um, um, a, a flight control system that could make it fly on its own if, if we lost control, if we had to evacuate the area so the drone could fly on its own and come back uh, into the, you know, into a safe area. But again, the, we got, not very often did we get really good uh, data from the high altitude drones. It was almost always the low altitude drones that got, got the worthwhile intelligence. And, um, you had mentioned the supersonic drone. What exactly do you mean by supersonic? Uh, it goes above Mach, Mach 1, speed of sound. Okay. Uh, Depend and that's this, that speed, it's usually around 660 uh, knots. Uh, you know, it just depends on the weather conditions, but the speed of sound is pretty much there. Never really got any anything useful out of the supersonic models. How are you able to control the drones? Uh, we had a, a spare univac uh, thing called microwave command guidance system, and it had a code plug that we changed every day so that um, the the drone to both receive and transmit information or to follow the, the actions of our control panel which was in our C-130 we would um, uh, it just automatically did this it was you know a system that was set up and if I wanted the drone to uh, go ahead you know two miles and skip part of the program because it had, although it had a, uh, a Doppler radar on board, at that point the Doppler radars weren't really, you know, wouldn't keep the drone up updated. It was, um, one of the problems with the drone was it, it wasn't a real accurate navigation, didn't have an accurate navigation system. That's a, another thing that really bothers me is that when I went to nav school, we had to learn 139 stars by sight, and we had to uh, uh, do the, the um, navigation by the stars and by uh, grid and a lot of work, okay? And if you were lucky, if you were out over the ocean and you took a fix, uh, took three star shots, and you have to extrapolate, you know, two minutes before on time and two minutes after, and all of that work, if you were within six or seven miles, you were really good, okay? And nowadays, we have these little things with our telephones and things, and we're within four feet, okay? I mean, that's really great, but it just pisses me off. All right? You might want to delete that, I don't know. Um, can you give me some examples of uh, some of the missions that these drones flew? Boy, uh, all of the missions that we flew were high category missions. Um, because we were a limited resource, we could fly, depending on which model of C-130 we had uh, in country, we could fly four missions a day, okay? So we would always fly um, missions, either Haiphong or Hanoi, um, the railway, the things that uh, were targets of the bombing 
or things that we wanted to know what was going on, like uh, Paul Doomer Bridge, which was a metal bridge across the uh, Haiphong Harbor. Uh, we flew against that a lot. Almost all, I wouldn't say all, but most of the manned aircraft that flew into that area were shot down. Uh, and then when you get shot down, you have to send in the helicopters and put a lot of more, a lot more people at risk. And we could almost always get good pictures in that area. Uh, high Hanoi, um, Radio Hanoi was probably one of the best um, physically protected things. It had a blast, two blast walls, uh, concrete, you know, eight feet higher than the building. Uh, um, also, it was always protected by SAM sites and uh, AAA sites, you know, all around it. Uh, we flew against it, the, the uh, railroads, um, the, the big railroad in uh, Hanoi, we, all, we flew that against that a lot. Um, staging areas, as you get down um, from the railroad that goes from Nam Din to Vin, we also flew against that a lot. Um, very specific targets, you know, not very much in the way of uh, looking for troop movement in it or anything like that. Sometimes that was we would get collateral, but uh, uh, we almost always flew against you know category one targets. What was your reaction to seeing some of this uh, technology for the first time? Because it was very advanced for its time. So. It was really exciting, and, uh, and it was it's tough because <clears throat> um, you know if you're if you're close to your mate, you you just want to say, oh, I have got the neatest thing that we're working on, you know, but you can't do that. Um, the, you know, as an organization, we felt like we were given really high priority. Um, the things that we experimented with were as, were as exciting. In a lot of ways, we were pre predecessor to the Predator drone, okay? We flew, I can remember one mission, one time we went over to Holloman Air Force Place and uh, my good, uh, Buddy Claude Goldsby was my, he's an ART who controlled, and this is when I was a, a ARCO, I was the guy that controlled the drone, okay? And he was my radar technician. He's the one that, you know, painted it and kept, it, tr kept track of it. So we went over to Holloman Air Force Base and our job was to take one of the drones that had pylons on it, <clears throat> and they had they had used it because one of the missions we also flew was chaff deployment. In other words, when we would fly a mission up in North Vietnam, um, one of the ways that you degrade radar is to shoot out these big rolls of tin foil. Okay, it's, they call it chaff. And with the, the pylons that were on those drones, um, we could use those to drop in 500 pounds on each wing. Okay, now the drone slowed down a lot. Uh, it was really hard to control. You had to keep the speed up. But we were thinking at the time, what if we could put a 500 pound bomb under each wing? Okay, now you have to drop both of them at the same time, unfortunately, too. Um, and dropping iron bombs takes a lot of computation, um, your speeds, your angle of attack have to be just perfect. When we went over to Holloman Air Force Base and tried, um, the closest we ever got to a tank was about half a mile. And you don't do very much damage to a tank if you drop a bomb a half a mile away from it. Uh, the, if you can hit a tank, I mean, that's the gold standard. If you can hit a tank, that's, that's good bombing. Um, there were some smart bombs used in Vietnam, but we were, you know, they weren't really interested in letting us have any of those at that point. Uh, once uh, society back home started, like the technology kind of started catching up, was it exciting for mm -hmm. you to be able to talk to your family about some of the things that you would? I, yeah, I could, I could, after, you know, after it's in the past and, uh, you know, the, we were pretty much out of Vietnam, obviously. Um, I could all, I could still talk about things and the and my kids and my wife um, 
they, you know, there's always scuttlebutt. They kind of know what we were doing. They didn't know exactly the capabilities or anything like that. But uh, it, it was exciting. I'm, 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 I look back and I'm, I'm really proud of, you know, the developments we made, um, the advances. Um, obviously, the, the Predator is a terrific platform. Um, accuracy, intelligence, and uh, it's a very valuable resource. So I, I feel like we had something to do with that. All right, going back a bit, um, obviously uh, you were a volunteer. Uh, what did you think of people who were, uh, like, I guess the, uh, the draft dodgers, the people who... Yeah. My best friend in high school was named Jim Bullard, a really smart guy. His wife was a teacher. Um, he and I probably went to the, uh, and this is back, you know, he, he was, um, uh, we went to the math contest together. Used to, high schools used to have a math contest and you go to the regional and you go to the state. And he, were, he and I were always the ones that ended up going to the contest. He was a really smart guy. Um, I was a butler, and it just happened to be one of the days that I was in ROTC, and you had to wear your uniform on Mondays. That's when you had your organization and all of the drill and that stuff. And Jim came to see me. He, he was At the time, he was going to uh, Rose Poly, and um, he told me that he was going to go to Canada because <clears throat> he just didn't believe in the war. He wasn't going to risk his life. And uh, I was really disappointed, but, you know, if I would have felt that way about the war, then I don't think I would have wanted to risk my life either. I mean, if you don't believe in it, you know, it doesn't make sense. Um, at the time, I believed in the war, and I, you know, still do to some extent. Uh, do you still have contact with him? Oh, wait, wait. I haven't, I haven't seen Jim. He, he's, he still lives in Canada. Um, he came back at his mother's funeral. Uh, he was arrested and then uh, released. I think there was a, um, a general amnesty. Um, and as, as soon as he was released, he went, went to Canada. And I assume that he still lives there. What was your training like? Oh, I, you know, I look back on my education and I think some of the best training I had was the military. Um, they were really, um, their job, did, they didn't feel like their job was to evaluate you, but to teach you what you needed to know. Uh, it was very practical, um, although there was, you know, theory, theory given along with the, uh, with the practice. Um, the navigation training was thorough, um, electronic warfare training was very good. I knew I had a good background when I got to my unit, I uh, knew what I needed to do, had all the skills that I really needed. The only thing, the only training I really didn't like was the survival school up at Fairchild Air Force Base. Um, and I guess it was worthwhile, but it just wasn't very much fun. So. Hey, you said you went to Butler. Did you finish school before enlisting, or did you take a break? And No, I, I, um, I finished school, uh, and at, you know, um, after graduation was commissioned to second lieutenant and went to um, Sacramento in California from there. What was your most vivid memory of boot camp? It, uh, the ROTC has what they call summer camp, and that's what serves as uh, kind of like boot camp. And, you know, we pretty much knew how it was going to be beforehand. You know, uh, you get yelled at a lot. Uh, you never do anything that's worthwhile. You're pretty much scum. And <laughs> um, But there's a method, again, we pretty much understood, then that, that part really didn't bother me. Um, you kind of um, 
learned how to get along in an or organization. Uh, you learned, again, social skills that you needed. Um, so for summer camp is boot camp for the ROTC and it's, uh, it was okay. Uh, where were you, where was the first place you were stationed after all of your training? Tucson, Arizona. Um, it's called Davis Monthan Air Force Base. And uh, it was a nice base. It's uh, the desert. It's right in the middle of the desert. And so, anyway. It almost sounds like your wife couldn't talk to you about certain things. She yeah, that's right. Her, so. Well, it was actually, it was, it was a public school, but oh. all, of the, all of the kids of yeah. the, the CIA staff, you know, went to it. It's Red Rock. Red Rock School, you know. So, all right. Yeah. All right. Um, press that on again. <laughs> what was your most fearful moment in combat? Um, without a doubt, the first night of the Tet Offensive. I mean, I'll never forget it. In fact, it got to be such. It's a habit. Whenever the sirens would go off any place else for years after that, it, you know, my heart would stop. It would just grab you. Uh, you think, okay, is this it? No. Um, it was terrifying. It was just terrifying. The, uh, uh, besides half of our base being taken over, there were, our, several of our trailers were, uh, uh, you know, the rockets or the mortar shells would land and they would spray shrapnel, you know, and if you would have been in that trailer, you'd be dead. You know, they were just uh, big, big, you know, patterns of uh, damage. And there was a uh, probably 20 or 30 yards away from our compound. Our comp compound was protected pretty well, um, with the exception of that night. The, the, uh, but the, we had like eight foot fences with concertina wire on top and right next in the same compound, the other half of the compound was again the SSO, and they were really they're protected really well too. Um, that, but you know the uh, the warehouse right next to us got hit, and it had must have had paint or something because it burned for a day and a half or two days. And we had, uh, you know, the communication was really sporadic. Um, they would call the, the main part of the base, the, you know, the command structure and ask what's going on and half the time they didn't know. You know, they, they weren't sure what part of the base they held and what, what part they didn't. We knew at the time that there were, there were enemy forces on the base and that's just, you know, that was hard for us to accept, hard for us to, to think about even. So, uh, obviously, there were errors in some of the missions that you might have done. Were there ever any major lessons that you learned that kind of carried over into later missions? Oh yeah, there's. Uh, we tried. We used every intelligence resource that we had, and we were we had available a lot. Okay, we worked directly with the Joint Reconnaissance Center, which is the. Uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, Central Intelligence thing, okay? I mean, the President, Johnson, uh, Nixon after him, got daily briefings at the Joint Reconnaissance Center. So we knew, we knew what we were doing. Um, we knew there was gonna be a raid on Sante, the prison camp before that happened. Um, we made, we made, there were a lot of errors we, we made, uh, n not n just, but always, almost always the, the errors that we made were that, were because we didn't know something. So the more information we had, the better our missions were. Um, a lot of times we would fly missions and uh, pick up information we hadn't, you know, didn't have any idea that we were going to get. We found uh, resources just because we left the camera on to use up all the film. 
um, we found we saw um, I can remember one mission we flew where the uh, the Russians had a ship in Haiphong and they we took pictures one day of, of you know one of the standard things we did was we flew over Haiphong just to see whose ships were there and what was going on and the Russians accused us of attacking their ship and one of the things that came out of the of our mission was that that the damage to their ship came from inside their ship it didn't come from outside so um, but mission okay mistakes we made uh, you know I don't I don't want to say that we were perfect but we I don't think we made any errors in judgment uh, you know we we did everything we could to get the missions off um, there were times when we launched drones that weren't perfect um, but we felt like if we were sent out to do a mission if we didn't get it then they might they might task uh, an RF4 or a, they also had a 101 called a voodoo crappy old airplane but it was a reconnaissance and they would send those up and uh, you know there was always if we couldn't get it and they really needed the information they'd send a man reconnaissance and uh, um, you know we felt at that time we felt like uh, if we couldn't get it if they had to send a manned aircraft it was a lot more dangerous so we did everything we could to get our missions off so do you believe that uh, your training really paid off then? Oh yeah, the training was great. Um, both Sperry with our uh, command system and Ryan Aeronautical, I think I ha I don't know how many sheets I have here of where I, you would have to go and learn about each individual drone and its characteristics and its uh, command structure and each one of those blue things is a training for a new drone. So they really really kept us up. Uh, we knew the, the drones that were, what they were trying to develop in the new drones, um, you know, so, and we, we had good, good information, good training. How do you think the American weapons and equipment compared to the enemies? Oh, it was a lot better. There were some, I, I think overall, strategically, there were some mistakes we made. Uh, the caliber of our weapons is so that if we pick up their ammunition, we can't use it, but they could pick up our, man, our ammunition and they could use it. Um, our, our pilot's training, um, the, the backup, I think in, in Vietnam, probably the, the uh, strong part of our um, the strong part of our air superiority was that we had such good technology, uh, radar coverage, both the flying, flying EC radar ships and the, uh, and the naval radar stations on the ground. Our pilots up there knew what was going on. The, there were times, a few times, um, you know, when the, uh, the North, North Vietnamese or the Russians or whoever were involved would fool us, um, get behind a, a uh, reconnaissance plane or something like that and we would lose people. I had a good friend, a guy I went to EW school with, Cliff Walker, was shot down. He was in a B-66 and a MiG-21 got behind him up over the uh, plane of jars, shot him down, he got captured was in the Hanoi Hilton for four years, I think. So. Do you believe you had high moral throughout the conflict? During the conflict, yes. I think in retrospect, uh, looking at the history, um, 
I guess in some ways I'm more irritated with our State Department than with our military. Um, I, from, from what I understand, okay, um, when the French lost Vietnam and Dien Bien Phu, uh, they encouraged us to be involved. Um, you know, at that point, we might have made some different decisions, but um, I think, you know, the alleged purpose is to, would have been to have a country in that part of the world that has a representative government. And I think, you know, still that would be a good, uh, I'm sure we don't want to go back and try to do it again, but still would be a worthwhile goal. Did it bother you that there was a lack of support for the war effort back home? Yeah, I think you make you make uh, uh, personal defenses, and you think that uh, um, you know the, those California people are that way anyway. Uh, they, uh, you know, obviously if, to be to believe what I believe, and obviously they believe something different. They look at the world in a different way. So yeah, we talked about them a lot. Did you write or receive letters uh, from family and friends back home? Yep, we tried to write every day. Um, we had a little recorder and I would send recordings home to my wife and kid, my sons, and uh, they would send them to us. There's very, really limited phone service, okay? Um, there were radio operators in the United States that would make their radios available. Uh, I think Barry Goldwater was one of them. That was one of the I used a couple of times. And uh, you could make international calls, but they were terribly expensive even back then. I think I called my wife once when she was having our, our uh, third son and uh, I don't know, I think the one phone call cost $100, which back then was quite a bit of money. So the communication, and it, and it was really important, really important. What was your relationship like with some of the other soldiers? Oh, it was great. What, you know, there's, especially flying on a crew with eight guys, uh, you know, your careers, your lives are linked. Um, you're there doing the same job. You've got the same background. You live in the same place back in the States. Uh, you're in the same organization. Uh, you just, you have a lot in common. You just, you develop uh, friendships that are just not like anything else. Haven't, didn't have any friendships like that before. Never had a friendship like that since. Are you still in contact with any of the people? Who Some of them, yeah. Yep. All right. Um, on your bio sheet, well, actually, uh, one of the, the phone interview, like the short phone interviews uh -huh. we had, you'd mentioned uh, Corona Harvest and the Pentagon Papers. Yes. Uh, could you ca talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, it just happened that I was, I, I was one of the people that briefed people. There was a lot of people that, once they heard about the drone program, wanted to find out about it, okay? And if they had the time, we always had people going through. So we would give a dog and pony show, you know, where the drone program started, what was the status, you know, what were we doing for the future, that kind of thing. Uh, and I was home, and so I knew a lot about the drone program. And so when they needed somebody to go, our, the, my squadron commander came to me and asked me if I would go. And uh, basically, uh, it was at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. And um, I went down there, and they had kind of a uh, bare bones uh, information. And I gave, I mean, they told us to spill our guts, tell about all the problems and the successes. Uh, you know, just everything about it. 
um, what we could have done better, uh, the question you asked a while ago, what mistakes we had made, and I was to look at it from our organizational point of view. You know, did we have problems organizational with our equipment, what we needed it to be? Um, were we located in the right place? Just everything. And so uh, I was there for about a week and uh, spent a lot of time talking with uh, the guys that flew the SR-71 and the U-2s and um, satellite, some of the, sat the guys that were working with the satellite program at the time. Um, learned a lot, <laughs> gave a lot of information. So, and that was, that was what it was called. Later, I went back to the same Air Force Base uh, to uh, Squadron Officer School. That's where Air University is. They do the training for Squadron Officer School. And they wouldn't let me read it. <laughs> and I was kind of indignant about that. I said, I wrote it, why can't I read it? But uh, anyway, it was, a, it was a neat, it was a, I felt good that we were looking at our, pro, you know, looking at what we had done and, you know, trying to figure out, calling through it, figuring out what we did good, what we needed to improve. Coming close to the end of the, the war, what were some of your aspirations and plans for when you returned home? I left, I think, probably about a year before we really f made the final pullout. Um, I was really disappointed. Um, you know, besides just being part of an organization that lost the war, um, you know, there's all kinds of recriminations. Um, I couldn't look back and say, if I had just done this, maybe it would have changed things, because, you know, obviously my part wasn't that great, um, but it was just, it was disappointing. I mean, if we set up the idea that we're there to help people have a freak, you know, a representative government, uh, and it didn't happen, and whether it was the mood of the country. I look back now and I, I th see the number of people that have died in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. There were 55,000 Americans that lost their lives in Vietnam. And I think probably, I don't know whether our country if we got involved, especially outside our borders, if we lost 55,000 people, I don't, you know, I don't know whether our country would, would accept that again. And, and, you know, I think probably it would end up the way it did again. Um, when exactly, oh, were you going to say something? No. Was, oh, sorry. When exactly uh, did you leave service and return home? Oh. June, I think I left on the 1st of June, my time, I had uh, leave built up, so I had a month of leave. So my official date was like July 30, or July 1st or something like that of 1973. Um, how did your family and peers view you after your service? Um, my dad was proud of me. Uh, my wife was proud of me. My boys were proud of me. Um, I was proud of what I had done in the military. Um, the people that were our friends and neighbors pretty much had the same view. What was the first thing you did when you returned home? We had, I had several tours, we would go two and three months at a time and then come back. And every time when we flew our own airplane back, uh, we didn't, but whenever we would leave on what they call the Freedom Bird, you'd get on the, uh, get on the jet airplane and everybody would cheer. I can remember that uh, on, the, on starting the trip back. And then it was, God, it was a long flight non-stop from Vietnam to Travis Air Force Base, I think. 
And uh, of course, I think they would cheer again when we landed in Travis. But the, uh, I hope you're not asking a personal question here, okay? Oh, I know. I... This was when the first thing I would do when I got home was I would go and I would make friends with my wife again, okay? We would usually take the kids over to the neighbors and after I hugged them and then, but uh, coming home was always good. What changes occurred in your life after the war as far as uh, your career and where you went after that? Um, when I came back, I was in a family business, a uh, retail business. And uh, and most most people were very appreciative of my service. Um, we came back and we were living in a little place in Grovertown, Indiana, over in the middle part of Indiana. And um, you know they were they pretty much had the same attitude about the war. Um, you know, that they respected the military, uh, appreciated the people that served in the military. So, ask me the question again. Um, when you, after the war, uh, what were, yeah. like, what, what did you do as it far was as? A, um, the impression I got after I left the family business uh, was that it was always a good thing to have on your resume, that you were an officer in the Air Force. Um, just because of the skills you build, the things that you've done, responsibilities you've had. So it was a it was a very positive thing, I think. What is your career now and how did you end up doing what you do? Well, I was in retailing for a long, long time. And uh, although there were times I enjoyed it, there was really never, you know, when you were in the Air Force, you have this thing that you're and it's putting it in a corny way, I guess, that you're standing on the ramparts of democracy, you know, you're protecting your country, that you're, uh, uh, you know, you're risking your life to keep other people safe. And in retailing, there's not that level of, uh, of being a good guy, I guess, okay? And so when I had a chance, especially in special ed, when I had a chance to uh, be a teacher, um, that appealed to me. And so, although it was a cut in pay, um, the hours were better. And uh, that was, that's something that I consider part of a teaching profession is that you're doing something that's helping society, that you're uh, making the world a better place. Uh would you say that you're a patriotic person? Yes. All right, well, oh, um. That's a short answer, isn't it? <laughs> that's fine. You want, like, to, you want me to? <laughs> well, if, if that's not even really, uh, that question is okay. really not that. Yeah, uh, okay. That's I just fine. have really one more question that I wanted to go back to. Uh, even if it was any, uh, something as minor as sleeping trouble, did you ever experience any effects of post-traumatic stress disorder? No. Um, The only, again, the only, the only time it ever bothered me was when I would, like there would be, uh, uh, on the Air Force Base, on Fridays at 12 o'clock, they ring, they check the, the uh, siren. And even though I knew I was back home, I knew I was safe, when the siren would go off, there's that just instantaneous reaction of, where's the bunker, you know? And it's it's it took a few years. <laughs> it took a few years to you know to get that out of my system. All right. Well, uh, that's about all I had. I'd like to give you this time to touch on anything that I might have missed out on or not followed up on, or if you want to show some of the pictures and stuff you brought or explain what some of that is. Oh. Okay. I thought I didn't know the, what this was going to be all about. That's my DD two. 214, right? Yeah, that tells all about the everywhere I was. Um, 
three years overseas and the, out of the seven. This is our, I had several different uniforms, okay? This is kind of a party uniform that has, uh, this is the little, I got a, a great story about the, uh, uh, the drones. This is a hat rack, which is a high altitude drone that tries to evade missiles. This is our bumpy action, or no, bumblebee, that's bumblebee. Uh, this is our crew patch. These are the uh, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, Korea. That's the American flag. And uh, whenever we would get together, uh, as a crew, or a lot of times as a uh, squadron, we would wear our uh, party suits. These are, this is not an official uniform, it's a party suit. Uh, these are, this is all my training, you know, my graduation certificates and all that crap. And then I have pictures um, of the, the drones, some of my crews. Is that... Can you see any of that? Yeah. Any of them? Uh, this is a this is a good picture. Is a drone taken off, and this is this is before we had the television camera in the nose. Okay, this is the uh, the probe. But then this one, and it's hard to see. Uh, this one over here does have a t television camera in the nose. That was a great thing. You could see. Actually, saved a drone one time. There's a huge mountain up on the plane of jars. Only mountain within thousands of miles, I think. And if we hadn't had that TV camera, we had a little bit of navigation problem, would have run right into that mountain. And it's probably hard to see this. We always do a mission debriefing, tell uh, the whole organization, our maintenance and everybody, how the drone operated, where we went, and all that kind of stuff. Um, mission planning, we had a light table, with, we'd use a map and our, the plotting board would show that where our airplane was and where the drone was. Um, did I tell you how they recover these things? Okay, the drone comes back and to save gas you fly up, even the low altitude models, you get them up to about 55,000 feet and you punch them off. It's got a huge parachute in its tail and the pair, the, there's a 15 foot drag chute. The drag chute comes out, slows it down, brings it down to 15,000 feet. At 15,000 feet, the Mars chute, the huge 100 foot parachute, pops out and the airplane shuts off, the, you know, the engine is gone down, shuts off all the electrical stuff. A helicopter comes along with a hook and grabs it. The parachute drops away and they bring it back to the ground and we load it back up on the airplane wild, wild operation. <laughs> oh, what else? A lot of it was on the ground. This is Vietnam. These are the APCs that they had uh, uh, miniguns mounted on the top. That's one of the things that helped retake the base. But the big thing that retook the base, Benoit, the thing that recovered the base was the air cav, the Cobras and uh, the Huey, the, the uh, Hueys with the guns. Sandbags in Vietnam, we had sandbags all over the place, every place. Thailand, this is, this is the page about Thailand, just a beautiful, beautiful country. Great place to be. All kinds of airplanes we used. We used airplanes in Vietnam, C-119, which is the old parachute airplane. Here is, oh, psychological warfare, okay. This is, a, this is an exact duplicate of a North Vietnamese 
currency. And on the end of it is a little piece of paper that says, cut off this end of the paper and spend this wherever you like. This is a piece of shrapnel from 122 millimeter. There's a lot of that laying around. That's a launch control platform where we'd start up the engine, check all the systems, that kind of stuff. And these are different crews I was on. This shows a picture of a, this is the type of airplane that they used in uh, Korea. And they were um, mostly monitoring communications in North Korea and China. And this, is, this also shows you the way that the, uh, the pylons were mounted. I don't know, you probably can't see those. That um, in there. That's all right. So anyway, anything else? No. If I could get your mic.